What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Tech Backstage. My name is Eddie, here with my co-host, Tulio Siragusa, and our guest for today, KP, former VP of Labs at Benetech. How you all doing today? Excellent. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, KP, KP thanks I'm for... I'm so excited to have this conversation about this. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a good one, for sure. Yes, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining us, KP. Um, Tuli, you want to start this one? Or you want me to start this one? Yeah, you know, I, I really, I'm, I'm passionate about this topic. Yeah, it's, uh, one of the reasons I've, I've stayed in tech for 33 years. Um, I remember when we first started many, many years ago. Technology was a way to become more efficient in doing things, predominantly used by big companies uh, to create automation. It was really about driving uh, better functions inside of a business and cut costs, right? But with open source, everything changed. So software became the great equalizer. Technology became how you democratize access for the masses for things that were historically only reserved for a few. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how software can empower communities. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you, KP. Maybe you can just start by telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got here, Congratulations, you've recently retired. Uh, something we all look forward to at some point, but not yep. yet. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Yes. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself you and let's kick it right into this conversation, see what we can learn. Yeah. So, you know, just by way of background, I've been in tech for, you know, over th three decades and, you know, worked, like you said, to Leon, you know, using uh, software to kind of improve efficiencies and, you know, do this in, you know, with a whole range and a whole range of companies, right? I worked at, you know, Sun Microsystems, you know, the county of Santa Clara, you know, a whole bunch of uh, startups and stuff like that. But, you know, as, as I've seen tech evolve, like you said, you know, what in the beginning it was, how do you drive efficiencies and how do you, you know, make businesses make more money? But now with technology, the barrier to entry for software has become really low. Right? So there's lots of these low code and no code platforms, which have made it very easy for people to come on board uh, and develop software really to, to address fairly pressing problems. And, you know, one of the biggest problems is how do you help people, uh, you know, empower people using software? And when I say people, I'm focused on our, the most vulnerable groups within, you know, within our society, right? How do you use software to help them? And so, that's been my journey and you know uh that's where i've worked on and still you know i keep my hand in just advising um you know advising companies and you know uh serving on a board here and there but um that's my passion is you know how can we use technology to actually help people um, do what they need to do and live their lives yeah very cool so tell us a little bit about uh, where you think we are as opposed to where we were and what's contributed to that? In your, in your opinion, what's helped us get where we are in terms of making technology more accessible, enabling and empowering more communities? How's that coming to play and where you think it, the opportunities still lie in terms of where the gaps of what it could do? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the the big shift which I've seen is Technology, you know, 10, 15 years ago really needed tech experts to be able for people to actually go use technology. But by that, what I mean by that is you needed, you know, you needed coders, you need, you know, programmers, you needed sysadmins, you need database administrators and what have you. You know, we had this whole class of people who, who you know, who you need in order to actually use technology to do what you need to do. And that's still true for a lot of, you know, enterprise, large enterprises and what have you, they still need that. And, and there's a place for that. But the shift which has happened is there's a lot of new platforms which are available where you can do basically, you know, non-tech people can use technology. They can code or they can put together software very quickly 
to address what they need to do in their business. So, you know, they can use uh, a whole bunch of platforms, you know, whether it's Zapier, um, you know, there's there's a lot, lots of low code and no code app development. I mean, it seems like there's one, you know, released every day, um, which people can use to uh, in their business and the, the setup costs or are, are next to nothing, um, you know, you can do it on, on a credit card. And so for a lot of these businesses, it, and particularly small businesses and non-for-profits, not-for-profits, they can actually use these platforms. So that's the big shift which has happened. They don't need a tech guru to help them to use tech. Uh, and I think the opportunity to answer the second part of your question, Julio, the opportunity is for these organizations and even for techies, to start thinking about how they can actually use the technology which is available today, the tools which are available today, to actually serve a lot of the population. You know, you have to remember that even with you know two billion people on Facebook, there's still another, you know, six seven billion people who don't have access to that platform. That's just a that's just a, a benchmark, if you like. Uh, but there's lots of people, you know, who are at the bottom part of the pyramid, so to speak. And that's where I think we need to focus our attention to use tech to benefit those, that group of people. Interesting. And I guess really quick, just just so that everybody uh, listening in, you know, is 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 aware. Like, can you define who those you know who those people are? Where you know, because sure. I know that we were talking about that earlier, but you you'd highlighted a couple, I think, really important groups, especially here in the U.S. right now, uh, that you know that I think fall outside the category of like everyday Facebook users, right? Like, right. you know, like people like us take it, take it for granted, you know, it's like we're, right. we're on our iPhone walking around, but there's, there's a lot of people even in the U S that are, you know, struggling to have access to, to the things that they need. Right. And, and I think the, the primary group are what I call, you know, the, the working poor. I mean, this is a term which is used a lot. Um, a lot of them are elderly people, but there's a lot of people who are young people, you know, in their thirties and forties who are working poor. And what I mean by that is these are folk who struggle every day to just make a living wage. To give you some figures, you know, the living wage in, in the Bay Area, depending on which county you are, ranges anywhere from $90,000 a year to $115,000 a year, give or take, for a family of four. Now, you know, if you take somebody who's working a minimum wage job or even, you know, getting paid a, a reasonable wage, but they're hourly workers. And I'd take $20 as, as, a, as a figure, $20 an hour. Well, if they're working full time, they're making $40,000. That still doesn't make living wage for their family. So if they work two jobs, that's still, they get $80,000 and that still doesn't get them to living wage, which is at 90,000. So both partners, you know, or spouses, husband, wife, you know, whatever, parents have to be working, you know, three jobs between them to cross the, you know, to get to living wage. So it's, it is, and then when they're doing that, if you think of the logistics, you know, if you're working, if both parents are working, well, you have to make really, you know, you don't have a lot of time and you have to make suboptimal decisions in terms of what, how you're going to feed your kids and, you know, because you're rushing from one job to the next. And, and so that is what fuels, if you like, a, a lot of the insecurity. And these are folk who, you know, live paycheck to paycheck. Um, literally, they don't have any savings. You know, we know the fact that, you know, over 50% of, of, of Americans don't have any savings. I mean, they're like, you know, maybe yeah. they've got 10, 15,000 or $20,000 in the bank. But, you know, many of them just don't have any savings. Yeah. And that is, that is a crying shame. I mean, we live yeah. in the most prosperous country in the world, and yet we have over half our population, you know, 160, 170 million people who are just struggling to live. Yeah. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that $80,000 a year isn't even a living wage in some places anymore. Wow. It is. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just, it's just staggering. And, you know, you think of the impact on kids and our future yeah. generation, right? So that's, that's where I think, you know, we, we really need to reset our priorities in terms of, you know, how do we actually go and use technology? 
for for because for these people, technology is just you know an esoteric term, right? It has right. It, they just have to be able to use whatever they have. Their phones have to work. You know, apps have to give them essential information, uh, and that's it. So um, you know, that's where I think we need to focus our attention as techies. That's our responsibility, I think, where we need to be able to help these people, um, you know, just live a better life. Yeah. You know, KP, there's often the mindset that technologists will tend to focus on something they can get support for, right? I mean, let's face it, most, most VCs uh, would rather fund a company that's got some clear revenue growth and exit objectives. Uh, and that's part of the problem. I, I think we could agree that's part of the problem. But is there a way, again, technology is the equalizer. It changes things. It creates opportunities as well for things that normally in the past would have been thought of as only for nonprofits. Is there a way that we can accomplish both? You know, do something really valuable for underserved communities and create more equalization across society and at the same time, Great wealth, great profit for those people involved. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, there, there, are, there's definitely. I mean, it's a great question, Tulio, and I think you know this is something which I've struggled with as well um, because you know you're right. I mean, the bulk of the VCs are not interested in investing in solutions which are at the bottom of the pyramid unless there's there's you know vast amounts of money to be made. Yeah, now, there are some VCs. And a lot of philanthropic organizations, as well as individuals, were looking at this and saying, look, maybe we're not going to go IPO and make a billion dollar or a $10 billion company or what have you and make you know, staggering profits and so on. But this is a population which is, which is really big. And so we'll make a small amount of money, but it's over a, a huge you know, population of people we're going to serve. Right? Yeah. And so... You know, I'll give you one example, and this is this is really from you know from India, for example. And in India, if you don't know, the telecom charges, your cell phone charges are the cheapest in the world. Okay, and the companies there have figured out that they can charge very little, but then because of the huge user base, they can still be profitable. So they figured that out. I mean, you can make a call, you know, a call in India costs you a fraction of what it costs in the U.S., right? Um, it's, it's just staggering. I mean, you can get a phone for 20 bucks or $25, the equivalent of 20, and its incoming is free for the rest of your life. It's, you know, it's just staggering, right? So it, it can be done. So, yeah. Do you, mm -hmm. I, one of the things I think that that's really important too, and I mean, I don't know how you feel about this KP, but I'm going to maybe throw this out there. That might be a debatable topic, uh, even outside this podcast, but you know, now it's, you know, especially if you're looking at the last couple of years and, you know, record profits, even, you know, during the pandemic on the stock market and stuff. But I feel like, uh, especially in the tech industry, you know, obviously I think this happens in other industries as well, but We've really normalized these, you know, these massive, you know, profit gains, these 10 X, like, you know, VCs are looking for the next 10 X all the time. That, like, that's the only thing they're interested in. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's driving um, even unhealthy growth in our industry. Right. Like is, I mean, do we always have to make 10 X, you know, on an investment or like, is it OK to make, you know, to make a, you know, profit still be a profitable company to help people out. But, you know, it, it's like everybody's really trying to be the next Facebook. They're really trying to be like the rock stars of the tech industry. And I just feel like, you know, maybe maybe the way that, you know, us as an industry is looking at, at how we make money and how we grow. Maybe it's just, you know, it feels a little bit unhealthy and, and unsustainable to me. Yeah, absolutely, Eddie. I agree with you. I mean, it is. It's like, you know, I've seen companies... For example, they say, okay, we'll make a bunch of money elsewhere and then we'll we'll set up a foundation. Uh, right, or we'll right. give to philanthropy, you know, yeah, or right. we'll we'll make it free for nonprofits to use our product or what have you. But you know, and and that works. But the point is, you know, if you have a product which is designed for enterprise or designed for large companies to use, a small, small not you know, non-for-profit 
is going to find it really difficult to go use that because yeah. they don't have dedicated IT resources. They they can barely afford you know their laptops and what have you. They can't invest. Their tech refresh cycle is ten years to never. Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it is. It is. So that's those are the kind of things which we need to kind of think about, right? Um, and so there are some VCs who are doing this. There are definitely, you know, uh, there are you know individual people, uh, you know, who are who are uh, you know spending their money, which they've made in tech elsewhere, spending their money and and giving that to not for profits to invest in in what they're doing. So. Um, you know, there's there's definitely that. I mean, you know, the the biggest one which stands out to mind is, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos, his ex-wife, Mackenzie Scott, oh, yeah. who gives him, you know, who's given away vast amounts of money. I mean, billions of dollars. I mean, she's the largest single donor, um, you know, in the world. And she's right. given away a huge, huge amount of money. Um, and she does it with no strings attached, right? So she says she picks, picks the... the the not-for-profits and says, okay, you know, here's a chunk of change, you know, big chunk of change for you. Go do what you do best and you know how to use it. And I'm not going to put any strings to it. So I think we need more of those and we need, you know, and we need uh, definitely more investment in technology. Um, mm -hmm. So there is the need. I mean, there's definitely the need for that. Uh, and we need techies to really start thinking about what it is that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Yeah. Just because something is technologically possible or feasible doesn't make it the right thing to do. Yeah. Right? So there's there's that too. So we yeah. you know, so ethics in in technology um, is definitely you know something which and you know diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know DEI. You see this everywhere, but how much of it is really practiced within? you know, by techies and in the technology which they're developing, right? So that's something which we need to look at. Yeah. It really feels like, honestly, a lot of times it really feels more like stuff that we just say to say mm -hmm. it because because it's the right thing to say right now in tech. Right. You know, it's like everybody's talking about inclusion and everybody's talking about, um, you know, ab about rights for people and, you know, having culture in the workplace. But I feel like a lot of people are just going through the motions, right? And um, you said something just a second ago that I, I wanted to touch on. Um, you know, you were talking about making tech that's inclusive for people. And, you know, we highlighted the working poor in the U.S. Uh, but, like, let's think about the rest of the world where we need to be using tech, um, you know, to help maybe maybe the, you know, the, the malnourished, you know, people that are starving in Africa, like, they're not even going to have access to internet. Like, what are we doing? You know, mm -hmm. everything nowadays is so focused on, you know, first world technology, like, you know, actually getting data out of people so that we can, you know, retarget them and market to them. And, um, mm -hmm. but it's like, what, what are the, you know, what are the startups, what technologies are out there that are solving real problems in places where like, you may not even have computers and be connected to the internet. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, one is, for example, there's a company called Zipline. I don't know if folk mm. have heard of this, right? I mean, so these folk are working in in Africa, and you know, one of the problems in Africa, there's lots of problems, but one of the problems is getting drugs and blood products to to people in remote areas in 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 Africa, particularly when the rains come, roads become impassable, and so you know, how do you get to these, right? So they're using drones. So this is high tech, right? I mean, this, the company is based out here. I think they're in San Carlos, Carlos, or someplace like that. But they're working in in Africa, and they're they're sending these drones, and they launch these drones, and they are able to go and drop blood mm -hmm. supplies and drugs to remote places and make that available. So that's an example of how you can use cutting edge, you know, first world, you know, leading bleeding edge technology. And they, you know, they worked out navigation and these are autonomous. I mean, they can navigate, these planes can navigate to where they need to go. So they're doing that, right? So it's it's those kind of things. Or like, you know, there's a company, um, I don't know the exact name, but, you know, which is developing, uh, you know, walking sticks and tools for, for blind people, right? Mm -hmm. To help them, give them, you know, it's so it's GPS enabled, um, you know, it, it gives them a touch, um, feedback 
on the walking stick and guides people, right? So this is a question. This is another example of tech, techies using technology to actually help people. You know, to your point about inclusion, we we forget people with with you know with disabilities. You know, we oh yeah. Very yeah. often we just don't think about people who are, you know, vision impaired or you know who have you know difficulty with with a whole range of other stuff, right? Who maybe. Uh, hearing impaired or anything else, right? So, so those it's there are people who are doing it, but I think we need way more people doing that kind of thing, right? And then that's the and that you know kind of that's where I think the tech has become accessible now, and I think there is there is a need and there is an opportunity for people to use that accessible tech to go make that happen. Yeah. Someone made a comment on LinkedIn. Uh, it's about the impact. Uh, thanks, yeah. Gustavo, for making that comment. And it, I can't help but think back to 2008, 2009, the last time we had an economic downturn that impacted millions of people in a negative way. And yet, this is not to single out Apple or anybody else, but yet companies like Apple had $200 billion in the bag, just sitting there in the bag, mm -hmm. hoarding money. Uh, again, not to single out Apple, they weren't the only company with that. There was probably about a trillion dollars across a number of big tech companies just sitting in the bank. Money mm -hmm. that, that wasn't moving the economy in any direction. Basically money being, being hoarded by big tech. So it seems as though today most of the efforts is just a tax write-off. But how do we get people to change the mindset? You know, how... How can organizations, instead of just individuals who might have had wealth come their way, who decide to give back after they've built the wealth, how do we get companies to share that wealth proactively and do good in society this way? I mean, what's what needs to happen, do you think? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's I think it starts at the top because it's the CEOs and the boards who have to actually make this call, right? I mean, you know, you think about the CEO of Gravity Payments, right? Who said, okay, there's a minimum wage of $70,000. That's right. what I'm going to pay my employees. I love that guy, by the way. Yeah. Right? So he, he took a pay cut. So, and people said, oh, you're going to fail. They didn't fail. They did really well, right? So, they, you know, they've had, they've been growing like crazy and they're doing, so there's this, uh, you know, misconception that if you pay people well, you treat people well, you know, or you spend the money which, you know, which you're making hand over fist, somehow it's going to, you know, or you're not going to be able to survive. Uh, and that's simply not true. The second thing is a lot of, a lot of our, you know, companies, they're not driven necessarily by, you know, what is happening around them. They're driven by Wall Street. They're driven by Every quarter, I need to make quarter on quarter. I need to show growth quarter on quarter. I need to show profits. And so I'm going to, you know, and for in tech, the biggest expense is people. And so how can I cut my expense on people? And, you know, just that's that's the way it is. It's like, you know, that's why they fight the wage, you know, wage increases. It's like, oh, we shouldn't pay people more. I mean, Amazon is like a wash in money. <laughs> right <laughs> it's just and and yet they they you know they just want to fight the minimum wage at every stage right and they, so these are the kind of things it's like it starts with the ceo and the ceo you know has to change and sometimes sometimes it may be you know it may be societal pressure but sometimes it's a very personal event which takes place for that mm. so it's it, when you really think about it, it's kind of productive, isn't it? Yeah. It, because you pay people less, they eventually spend less, which doesn't contribute to the economy, which ultimately comes back to you. It's just kind of productive. It's totally counterproductive. It's, you know, you people, you pay people well, they're going to go out, feel good about themselves. They're going to spend money. They're going to, you know, it, it goes into the economy. It's the same thing with, you know, this, this is off topic a little bit, but, you know, it's the same thing with healthcare. It's like, you know, why don't I, I want, I want everybody. I want marginal, I want my daily workers to have really good healthcare. Why? Because they're the folk who are preparing my food. 
They're the people who are coming in and cleaning houses. They're the people who are minding our children. We want them to be healthy and safe so that they're, you know, so we, we want them to be really clear, you know, have really good, clean health care available to them so that they, they don't fall ill because they're the people who keep the economy running, right? And so it, it is, it's, you're absolutely spot on, Tony. I mean, this is counterproductive. We need to be able to pay people better so that they can, you know, they can live better lives and they make, you know, they will make our lives better. Now let's talk a little bit about some efforts to have changed the system a little bit. Like let's take cryptocurrency, for example, right? It was supposed to democratize access to money and the value that you put behind things, which could potentially make it more accessible, but it turned into a game for the big you know, boys and girls to make more money, right? And that inevitably causes ups and downs, ups and downs. So what do we need to do? What's the call to action for technology companies, for software companies to change this, to create an environment? You know, you know clearly what I heard is you want to fix inflation, pay people more money. <laughs> <laughs> Problem fixed. Um, so what do you think, you know, as technology companies, what do we need to adopt more of to create more of an equalization in the world? Yeah, I, I think fundamentally it needs a an attitude shift. It needs people you know, at the C-suite to be thinking differently about what they're, you know, how they're, uh, you know, how they think about technology, right? Um, and and that's the whole thing. It's like, you know, it's not just about the money, it's about the people and people need to rethink that. Is that going to happen tomorrow? I don't believe so, right? I mean, we have we have fostered this this whole culture of, you know, me first, and I've got to make my, you know, my pot of gold, and then I'm going to go take care of everything else, and you know, then I'll write a check. So it's about, you know, that's not going to solve the problem, right? It's so it is going to require a societal shift, and I think it comes from education. It comes from teaching people, teaching kids to be more generous. And teaching kids to think about their their fellow, you know, children in their classroom, and that's where it starts from, right? And it's um, so, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a mind shift, and I think the younger generation is kind of glomming onto that, and I think there is a change, but it it will take, I think, you know, at least a generation or two before that happens, or something major happens in the world to disrupt the economy. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And I think we're kind of going in that direction. Yeah. So we're, we're coming up on time. Uh, Eddie, you got some uh, final question for KP. Otherwise, I've got one follow up. No, I do take this one, man. I, I think you're. <laughs> Look, you've had a, a career in tech. You've spent uh, three decades. Any words of wisdom? You've seen the value tech can create both financially for the participants, but also in democratizing access for less. Uh, well-served areas of the world. What words of wisdom would you have to share, share as a retiring tech executives? You know, I'll, I'll leave you with two three-letter acronyms. Okay. The first one is API. And API, everybody knows API. You know, it's not an application programming interface. It's, in my parlance, it's assume positive intent. Mm. Okay. I think we start with that. When we meet people, we talk to people, whatever we should assume positive intent that people do have, you know, they want to do good. They wake up in the morning, they come into work, they want to do a good day's work. So I think that's one of the things which we should absorb and, you know, take in as a culture is just assume positive intent. The second one, and this, I'm going to, this I stole actually from a, a person I worked with at Cisco, um, you know, it's ROI and we know it's return on investment, but no, actually it's relationship over issue. How do you maintain the relationship? The issues will come and go, but I think what we need to do is to make sure that we nurture and keep our relationships with people and grow those. Mm -hmm. And if we do those two things, then irrespective of what happens with tech, irrespective of what happens in the world, we will still do the right thing by our fellow human being. And I think that is what is important. And with Amazing. that, it's a wrap. <laughs>
I mean, thanks for joining the tech backstage. Uh, we've gotten a backstage look into a 30 year career in tech. And uh, the most amazing lesson is it's all about people. That's it. Take care of people. Absolutely. Thanks Thank you very much for having me. I really, this is, this is enjoyable. Thank you. Stay with us as we uh, get off the air in just a second. Sure. Come back again on Friday. We're going to have another show at 1.15 p.m. Central, 11.15 a.m. Pacific. We'll come back then and we'll announce what it is. Keep your eyes open. See you back soon.